On this episode of Opolis Public Radio, we dig into emerging governance, cooperative networks, economics, and really just the discussion of all of these topics through uh, my discussion with a thought leader from the space. And welcome to episode seven. Today I'm joined by Nathan Schneider. Nathan is an assistant professor of media studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, where he leads the Media Enterprise Design Lab. His most recent book is Everything for Everyone, The Radical Tradition That is Shaping the Next Economy. Nathan, good to see you. Really good to see you. Yeah, thanks for joining me. Appreciate it. We're all doing the COVID lockdown thing. So like the podcast and virtual sort of uh, sharings are kind of an interesting medium nowadays. Yeah, it's a thing. It's, it's, but it's valuable. You know, it's important for people to have an excuse to talk to each other and, and catch up. While we're on that topic, um, what's going on with uh, CU Boulder for the fall? Did, does anybody know yet? Are you guys doing distance, virtual, yeah, canceling we're doing hybrid. everything? Hybrid. We're doing hybrid. I won't call it a mess, but it's a, it's, it's complex. I'll call it a mess. It's always a mess. <laughs> my, my daughter's school is a mess. Like they can't decide what they're going to do. And yeah. it's like, look, I, I, I just let's make a decision and move on. Yeah, with our I, well, lives. I'm all for returning to the medieval model of figuring out how to just keep kids at home, and you know, and and rework work around raising kids in a healthy way. You know, I, I it, it frustrates me how frustrating it's been to have to you know work while <laughs> having two little kids around. But I, you know, it tell me about me it. What could we change so that? it would actually be okay to have kids around while, while we're, while we're working and while we're trying to contribute to the, to the wider society. Cause actually that, that should be able to, that should be possible. Well, it, it sounds great in theory. I think when you're talking about the practicalities in my world of a six year old and a three year old, it's <laughs> a little easier said than Hey, I've gotten four and ones. <laughs> yeah. You know, the drill then. I mean, the, the one year old's not so mobile yet though. Like, Six and three, oh, it's just, uh, it's very interesting. Although I'm, I'm, in a lot of respects, I'm not complaining either. Like I've got to spend quite a bit of time with my kids. That's the thing, that's the thing. Work-life integration, which I'm a big proponent of, has taken on a whole new definition with the pandemic. Yeah. Like in ways that I never thought. It has. I'm not sure I got it cut out to be a teacher professor type though. Like I'll leave that to you. Maybe I'll have to learn a few things because like my um, uh, proctoring of homework studies has not been so great. But anyway, <laughs> I think the secret, the, I mean, the problem too is the problem is our jobs are mismatched for life and our education's mismatched for life. Right. But the, you know, the challenge is to, to match them all together so that life, work and education fit together you know where where the you know the kids are learning by somehow participating in the parents work and um you know it's i mean it goes back to the idea of child labor right um you know child labor was outlawed you know uh in the modern era this is a modern invention you know when when people are living agrarian lives children you know they were the company the work yeah and, and if you have a and, farm in iowa they're still doing it so <laughs> and no, it's it, my, my members of my family grew up with that for sure. And, and yeah. they're still doing it. And those who are still on farms, but it was when work became really, really dangerous and really, really bad for everybody that we had to say, okay, let's at least kids shouldn't do this. Right. But if we're going to go back, you know, if we're going to recover a kind of work that's worth, that's actually humane, um, you know, a measure of that would be the moment when we can say, okay, actually kids can be involved in this again. How do you see that? Uh, I mean, do you actually think that that's a thing? Like the future of work is a big topic on this show, right? So like, do you really think that kids are going to be sort of re-included back in the workforce? I mean, we do have a contracting labor force. So there is uh, not in theory, but I think in reasonable prediction going to be a labor shortage for high skilled jobs. Uh, apprenticeships are re-emerging as a thing. You know, the, the, the sort of uh, structured... 16 years of education is got a lot of holes in it right now. I mean, there's, yeah, that's right. what do you, what, so, so paint me a picture. What does that look like? I, well, I, I don't know the whole picture, but I, I certainly see the, you know, I see the cracking at the university, right? You know, you see that this is, there, there are some fundamentally broken things about this system 
it isn't that the university is a bad thing. It's that it's that the way that we're used to do it, this industrial education model, you know, uh, is is messed up. And and you know the way you're describing too, this idea that you have to do all this busy work, all this homework, all the time, you know, uh, to train people in this discipline of doing things that are unpleasant um, as a as a matter of course, because this is what you're going to have to do when you get a real job, right? Um, right. And, you know, you, and, work sucks, so it may, you might as well just get used to it and do all this other stuff that's terrible, right? Exactly. But if you look at, you know, I, I mean, one thing I did a lot when I was younger, you know, um, before all these kids, you know, is I, I would travel a lot and I would, I would, you know, spend time with um, families who are kind of living off the grid. You know, this is kind of a repeated experience when I was working as a reporter and when I was a student. And, you know, I was just always amazed at how smart those kids all right, guys, it looks like we lost Nathan. I thought I might be frozen, so we're going to wait for Nathan to jump back on. Um, while we do, um, a partner entity of ours, ETH Denver, has been partnering with the state of Colorado um, on the Colorado Lottery Game Jam. So if you haven't checked that out, here's what's really interesting about that. The state of Colorado is actually crowdsourcing their their, a new game for their lottery platform through a hackathon or what's being called a game jam. So it's been a really interesting thing to watch kind of the, the level of participation that we've seen in this through, uh, I think there's like 20 something countries represented and almost 200 participants. So if you haven't seen that, uh, you can go to um, the Colorado Lottery webpage and check out the, the, the site. There's um, actually a game jolt page. If you go to gamejolt.com, and uh, enter Colorado Lottery Game Jam, you'll, you'll be able to find that. So um, give us just a minute here while we get, uh, actually, let me give you the exact address here. It's uh, jamscott.gamejolt.io slash Colorado CO Lottery Game Jam. And uh, there's over $25,000 in total prize money and it's actually happening right now through this Sunday evening at midnight is when projects are due. So give us just a minute here. Uh, we're going to get Nathan back on, um, and hopefully we can get the technical challenges taken care of. Well, why don't I give you a quick update on a few things that are happening with Opolis. So we've got a new product release coming out. We're going to be adding all of our dashboard fight features and functionality here in the coming weeks. That's going to be really interesting. So all of your history and accounting will be available to you at your fingertips. Uh, we've added support um, for automated um, currency conversions. So um, if you are electing any of your payroll in a different currency aside from USD, all of those things are now going to be fully available to you to configure from your account. Um, that's part of the dashboard release. So really cool and interesting stuff. Something just got disconnected here uh, on everything for a few minutes there. Sorry. Well, welcome to the virtual world. It's totally okay. So wh 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 why don't we just jump into yours and mine favorite topic, governance. All right. And the future of the G word. So governance is a really complicated subject. I think more so than most people quite understand. I mean, the history of governance, like different, different governance models, technology and governance, like all of these different things. What are the most important current trends that you're seeing, not just research-wise, but what are you seeing being like really um, experimented with? What are, the, what are the top use cases for innovation or modernizing governance systems? Yeah, well, it's kind of good news and bad news um, as, as I see it. So on the one hand, you know, what were the, the legacies of, of governance among peer groups in online communities, like I think is, you know, despite the creativity and imagination and initiative of lots of people, the tooling, the infrastructure behind it is really bad. Um, you know, and this is something that I call in, in my, in uh, some research, implicit feudalism, is this idea that, that the, all you need to govern a, a community is like mods and admins who have infinite power, no term limits, and the ability to silence and remove people at will, um, is, is a very- Sounds like weird. social media. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is Facebook groups, this is AOL chat rooms, this is, this goes back to early BBS 
thing, uh, you know, uh, uh, boxes before the internet when people were running social networks out of their houses. It's all the, you know, this is this logic has been adopted everywhere. Um, when you start a GitHub project, when you when you create a mailing list, it's all based on this idea of of these omnipotent admins and. Um, and, and that's really weird. There are reasons for it, um, but I don't think they're that good reasons. And, um, and it's mostly kind of this neglected, sad thing that, you know, my mother's uh, 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 garden club in her neighborhood has more sophisticated governance than just about any online community I've ever been part of. Um, and, and that's because she's inheriting this, this offline legacy of civic organizations that somehow did not translate into the technology, at least, of, of online communities. Now, there's a lot of cool stuff happening now. Um, you know, certainly in the blockchain area, there's a lot of experimentation because people now really have a, 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 big, a good reason to figure out accountable governance on the network, um, not just kind of right. around the network or in how we talk to each other, but it's got to be baked into the technology or it doesn't work. So there's cool stuff happening there, but it's also, I think, often very naive in the assumption that, you know, one thing will solve the problem. Proof of work will solve the problem. One mechanism is all you need to make, you know, quote unquote governance happen. You know, and, and just to, you know, finish this, you know, once I was at a, a blockchain conference hearing people describe, you know, what they f expect, you know, governance to look like. And it just got me thinking about all the stuff that it takes to run any community organization I mean, or anything. company. Yeah, it's just a ton of relationships, lobbying, culture, ritual, um, uh, uh, usually about, you know, 15 different structural mechanisms. Um, you know, there's just all sorts of stuff that goes into this. And, you know, it's time to tool up big time. And do you think Web3 or the blockchain community is, is um, when you say naive, do you think that they're just like oversimplifying? Is they're just like assuming that the panacea is some sort of like disintermediation, automated tech tool that, and you're saying that's too simplistic. It, it's early days, right? So it's, yeah. so, and, and these are engineers largely. So, so the, the engineer's impulse is, okay, we have a problem. Let's find the, the algorithm that will solve that problem, right? Um, let's find right. the beautiful solution to that problem. That's how engineers are trained. And, and then there's fine. human nature, right? And like the, there's human nature. And so the result is you end up with, um, you know, what the 70s feminists called, especially Joe Freeman called the tyranny of structurelessness. You end up with, um, you know, a bunch of a bros being like, okay, we got this app that, you know, is, is we're doing, you know, on-chain governance on the blockchain. And in fact, like there's a, um, there's a group in the background, disproportionately women who are managing the community using all sorts of like soft power and, and uh, relationships and, and careful, like writing newsletters and and curating information, doing all sorts of stuff that is making the illusion of on-chain governance happen. Um, and and you know, I, I think there's going to be a need. We call that from, crypto theater, right? I mean, the crypto theater. You know, they're they're kind of right, creating. right, yeah. right. No, it's a it's amazing. I mean, I've seen projects that are designed to do one thing, and they. Are pretending to do that one thing but then actually you look at the community and that one thing is happening actually manually in the background on the telegram channel or whatever it is and and it's, hmm. it's um you know which isn't to say you know this is a dead end you know i think actually there is a process right now happening where people in the blockchain space are are recognizing hey you know we need you know more complex stuff more diverse mechanisms you know starting to introduce new you know, new slash old things like, you know, the jury, uh, the model of a jury, um, you know, having multi um, modal governance. So you have a, a distinct legislative and executive branch, you know, it, I, I, it kind of feels like we're reinventing, you know, the history of, of governance all over again on, on chain. And it's kind of fun to see that, that discovery happening, but, you know, it, it kind of begins with this, with, you know, an understandable, but, but um, you know, kind of simplistic assumption that this could, this was going to be easy. Yeah, and and I, I think if I rewind the clock to 2017, I think that this is going to be easy has sort of worn off from that. I think. Okay. I, I mean, what I've seen is uh, a lot of really really bright people build really really interesting things that no one effectively uses, 
and it, it's not that well i think i think the conceptual form of governance or like you know creating almost an idealistic format um saying well this is how governance should be sort of is is you know, uh, one way to approach it, but it, it doesn't seem terribly practical. It seems like what's happening now is people are now looking for more sort of like approachable use cases that you could like pragmatically engage people. Whereas, you know, like for example, you know, in, in a lot of the, the governance mechanisms that you see in the blockchain space, like there's no, there's no functional reason why I should participate really. I mean, aside from just, novelty and you know I don't, I don't have like a meaningful part of my life staked in this thing you know like whatever it might be i mean even if it's a um, protocol like decred like proof of stake okay and i've got my little voting stuff that i do and you know there's a hybrid proof of work concept so it sort of keeps some balance and calibrates it but aside from being a token holder there's no real reason to do that and there's there's nobody who's really token holders. I mean, on the grand scale, like when you talk about like affecting change on a widespread basis, it's just not, it's not anything that most average people are ever going to care about. Right. Yeah. So th yeah. I think this is where, um, Opolis is, I think we're, whether we're leading or following that trend, I don't know, but like, I think that's what we've tried to do is say, well, what what's like really core and fundamental to a person's commercial experience, right? Like, well, in, in my background, having come from employment and HR and HR tech, it's like, well, I mean, everybody really has to deal with paychecks and everyone has to deal with payroll and benefits and healthcare and all, in the U S of course. And, and like all of these other sort of ancillary sort of necessary evils, right? Like, we take a lot of that for granted because the current engine that drives that stuff is the corporate engine, right? Mm -hmm. And there's all of the infrastructure and systems that are designed to support the corporate mechanisms, like facilitate that stuff, right? But now the labor trends moving from this corporate model to, you know, more of a user centered, you know, not, you know, sort of in the spirit of the Web3 space, like the user-centered internet, right? Like moving away from corporate dominance to like, you know, user-controlled networks, community-owned networks, um, you know, really getting to a, a, a version of capitalism that might be described as stakeholdership versus shareholdership mm -hmm. um, is kind of an, you know, we've sort of approached it from that standpoint. What, what do you... Um, what do you see happening in, in that space? Like when you talk about cooperatives and, and moving sort of the pendulum from like, not just what Opolis is doing, but like what other things are you seeing happening? What are these use cases that maybe you think are good experimentation zones for um, a functional and adoptable governance models and experimentation with new tech? Well, you, I, I mean, you're hitting on something really important when you say, you know, what, where, where is it that it really matters? You know, where it's yeah. going to matter enough for people to participate, and and you know that that's important. You know, I mean, I mean there are certain spaces in our lives where um, where we do want to participate, we do want to have a say, and there are others that we don't where we don't want to have a say. And you know, the question is how to make all of those appropriately accountable. Um, and work is something that I think is, you know, is a really important thing to target. I mean, we, we live in a, you know, there, we, we see survey results, for instance, where most people feel um, unengaged and disconnected from their work. And 70%. No, it's, it's, it's seven out of 10. It's right. insane. And, and um, <laughs> so, you know, so the, the world that I've, I've been in, you know, focused on for the last few years has, has been the world of cooperatives, which is a, an old form of business where people are own, owning and co-governing their, their, um, the businesses they interact with. And in some cases, that means that there are workers uh, uh, that are, you know, co-owning and co-governing their workplaces. Um, but, uh, you know, all of this points to, I think, a very sensible idea, which is that, you know, participants can and should, you know, have a say in the stuff that they care about and in the stuff they rely on. Um, you know, the problem is, I think we've um, uh, uh, we, we've we've allowed the growth of a system that that disempowers people, an investor ownership model, 
um, that it's that, all driven by capital. It's well, the, it's based on the logic that yeah, that, that the capital holders should be the ones in charge. And the capital the, is what quantifies value, and it's in in this sort of information age or technological age that we're in. Like the value isn't really just created through capital anymore. Right. And, and, you know, even if, even to the degree that it is the idea that you hand all the power over to capital, you know, that's a decision that was made, you know, about how the, about how the economy should be organized, um, made over time through lots of small decisions. Um, and there was a time where, you know, cooperatives were um, starting to gain some of the same access to capital, for instance, but it was member controlled capital, not, not investor controlled capital. And, um, and we, we really kind of left that model behind. So, so we ended up with, you know, actually in Britain, the cooperative model was made legal as a corporate structure before the modern investor owned corporation. So it's an older model no. in certain respects, but the investor ownership got accelerated and lots of tax benefits and lots of, you know, lots of little tweaks, you know, 1979 opened the door for pension funds to invest in venture capital. So the VC market gets going. So all these little decisions accumulate with a massive advantage for investor ownership compared to community ownership. Well, it seems like we've really been incentivizing that. I mean, that's when you say these little decisions, I mean, it's real, whether it's legislatively or whatever, I mean, it's being it's being pushed as as an engine that, and when people are kind of looking at decisions about how to organize and and where they can get capital i mean they're going to look for the you know the best chance of survival and sustainability and it look and and then we've also created this this machine of the i don't know the I think it's a mirage personally, because when you look at the stats, most startup businesses fail, right? Mm -hmm. So like the probabilities of actually having an exit in a, in a startup effort is like very, very small, much less a home run. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like forget about it, but it seems like, you know, that's what people focus on is it's like they're panning for gold and they're all looking for that big nugget when, when really it's, it's, it's sort of, you know, it, it's, it's elusive, right? And it's, it's not real in a lot of respects, but we promote it and promote it and promote it. And I mean, gosh, I've got several friends that have started businesses that had a really altruistic, great appeal to them, right? And for one reason or another, whether it was a, a capital thing or, or whatever, like they just, they just couldn't get it um, they couldn't get it built. And it's, it's, you know, is it a waste of creativity? I don't know. I mean, th there is some personal responsibility that people have for these things, but like, it seems like the mechanism for building these things, um, for building innovation is sort of aligned against public good in a lot of respects, like in the long term, right? It's it's aligned for us, you know, according to a certain way that we figured out how to how to fund new things, and uh, but there are a lot of gaps, that, you know, and venture capital is really really good at high risk stuff that takes over whole markets, and you know it has certain features um, that you know that have been useful for certain things, but what about everything else? Um, you know, one, one of the things that, that my lab and collaborators have been working on um, is this idea of exit to community, right? So we're trying to add a third exit option, not just yes. exit to acquisition or exit to IPO, but an exit to community ownership. And our idea is if you add, you know, additional exit models and, and trajectories, you can, you, you add whole new classes of companies. Um, you know, companies that are designed to build community and to support community and ultimately to become accountable to those communities. Um, and, and, you know, all this is to say, you know, yeah, there are some things that VC does really well and, and, um, and there are some things that are really scary about it. But obviously, if you rely on any one model for everything, um, you know, you're going to get in trouble. And, and certainly for um, projects that are aim, aimed to create a social good and that are aimed to serve communities, um, you know, we should have available uh, the means for them to be community owned ultimately. And, and that's the way the, the early investors and early founders get. Yeah, they get, they get exited. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I, I mean, I love, I, I'm familiar with your, your terminology that you've created there because I, when I heard it first, I was just like, yes, this is exactly what we need. 
you know, what we need is uh, we need a, uh, we, we talk a lot about the, the function of sustainable uh, benevolence, right? Like legal and technological means and mechanisms. Um, and there's layers to this, right? Because it's not just, you know, it's not just a legal corporate structure and it's not just technology. There's, you know, the, the board dynamics and how people have got voting and governance and like how things actually get executed. But it seems like, well, here's an interesting trend. So when you look at what motivates people in work, we talk about 70% of people being disengaged, right? And you look at the current iteration of capitalism, we have a system that really creates labor arbitrage on behalf of capital, right? So where the value comes from is people go to work for these large organizations, their productivity goes into the pot, it's basically farmed and extracted on behalf of capital, and they get a wage and benefits and other things in return, right? So there's there's this sort of like, you know, you could call it, it's, it's a industrial revolution reciprocity, right? It's, it's that version of it. But it seems like what, what's really happened is that method is not only misaligned with where things are going commercially, but it's also misaligned with what's important to the labor force. Because, you know, boomers aside, when you survey the Xers, Yers, and Zers on what's important to them in work, it's alignment of values and sustainability and really kind of thinking more than just as work as a means to an end, which is really what work has been by and large for many, many millions of Americans through the 60s, 70s and 80s, or even post-World War II. It's really just safety and security and feeding my family. Now people are really seeking to align what's important to them with what they get up and do every day. And in order for that to be sustainable, it just seems like the corporate, I mean, for, I mean, underneath the governance is really how we've set these things up to be sustainable and, and, and meaningful to individuals on a long distance basis, not just like, well, what's the next private equity acquisition or exit or, you know, how do we pump the stock price or whatever, but like, how do we really get down to brass tacks and drive value and activity in these networks, these, whether they're cooperatives or digital co-ops or yeah. crypto networks or whatever we want to call them. It just seems like this is the next logical thing. But ironically, even in the crypto space, most of the capital is still being organized the old way, yeah. which is, which is sort of, I mean, it's kind of funny to me because like, I, I, I'm like, am I missing something? I must be dumb because like, I don't see how, you can, you know, do a traditional Series A and essentially give up your boardroom and and maintain that benevolence over time because they have very specific game designed intentions. And, and like, it's not bad. I'm not judging it. I'm just saying that that's what they do. And it's it's sort of antithetical. I mean, it's like almost competing. I'm going to let you comment on that. So go ahead. No, it, it, it's... It is interesting to see the repetition and the replication. Um, you know the the way in which patterns from from the world as we've we've experienced it here are being are being brought back into this. And it, you know partly is because the crypto space is inheriting the kind of inequalities and the and also the cultural habits you know of, of the economy around it. But you know it really doesn't have to be this way. I mean it, it's. Um, you know, I, I remember once going to a, a seminar on cooperatives in Italy where they have a very vibrant co-op sector and, and, you know, one of the, you know, leading deans of, of cooperative economics there said, well, you know, some things co-ops can't do, like own uh, nuclear power plants. And in fact, in the United States, uh, electric co-ops do own nuclear power plants. Um, that's because policy was created during the New Deal that enabled, you know, groups of people to access capital to build electric utilities for their communities. And, um, and that's a revenue positive program for the Department of Agriculture. So this isn't charity that enables that to happen. This is just good structures. And, um, and so, you know, you can think about creating structures that reverse a lot of the equations we're used to. So, for instance, we're used to the idea that private equity is something that capitalist traders do to workers, right? It's they buy up companies, fire a bunch of workers, you know, 
transform the nature of the company? Well, right now, one of the most exciting things going on, including, you know, um, one of the leaders is, I believe your lawyer, Jason Weiner, um, is this idea of flipping the private equity equ equation so that workers are the holders of the, the holding company and the holding company decides then what kinds of businesses do we want to do? And, um, and it is the one that, 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 you know, decides what do we, what would be meaningful for us? Um, and if you could create structures that ensure that people doing that could access financing the way that, you know, solitary rich people can do right now, um, which is a very reasonable proposition. You know, the idea that, that groups of people should be financeable just like um, individual rich people or groups of rich people, um, large capital holders, you know, suddenly you open up the floodgates for a new kind of creativity, a new kind of um, a, a business that can emerge. Um, but right now, you know, for instance, you know, the President Trump in 2018 signed a law saying that um, this, the Small Business Administration needs to get rid of the, um, you know, the, the individual guarantee for, for small business loans. And the SBA still has not actually implemented that directive from Congress because they're so afraid of the idea um, of of lending to groups of people. But this this is something we've done before. Um, it's been wildly successful, um, and it's something that should just be normal. And and you know, hopefully, blockchain. Uh, tools can help demonstrate that by just trying out these new models, creating the space of play. Um, you know, I'd love to see more of that rather than this kind of replication of the system, you know, we already have, except, you know, yeah. people hope for fewer regulations on it. Well, and, and I haven't shared a lot of this with you yet, but we are working on a uh, bootstrapping mechanism for a reward system that essentially is an equity granting system. Um, so for consumption, participation, building reputation, like all of those other value creation vectors, as opposed to just capital, I mean, it, it, uh, it's likely gonna be on a bonding curve. And, and so the equity grants are to the workers or to others? To, the wor to workers, to people actually in the commons, right? So those consuming services based on the volume, that's the initial release, right? Like, but there will be probably other things uh, released later on where you can, you know, stake and do other things to actually like, you know, earn additional um, equity in the commons. And then you will be able to invest. But the one thing that we're doing is intentionally curtailing um, the power of um, purely economic investors, mm -hmm. right? They'll get enough um, other goodies in the bag, like liquidity, uh, one, and they'll also get, um, um, dividends, right? So we're sort of horse trading dividends and liquidity for governance, right? Because governance really in the end doesn't, um, well, if you're going to talk about alignment of actors, right, and keeping the game design sustainable so that you're not, you know, creating that divergence where, you know, usually capital and, and users over time diverge in their alignment of incentives. Well, that, um, and that, I, what you're trying to create there, this is an example of where um, you know, clearly innovation is needed, right? I mean, right. you know, years ago, I, you know, I started working on this platform co-op stuff and we were always like, oh, okay, you know, the big enemies are like Uber and Airbnb, these big platforms that, you know, centralize everything and, and um, exploit the contributors and, and all of this oh, for right. the investors and whatever. But yeah. now, you know, in 2018, 2019, those companies were filing um, letters to the SEC um, begging regulators to let them do equity grants to their users, right? Um, th even these companies recognize the value in loyalty the value and alignment that would be gained from having their users be part of the cap table, right? And because we, the rules are designed for employee grants, employee stock grants in certain ways, um, this is, you know, this was not something that they were able to do in any meaningful way. Um, but, but, you know, the fact that these big bad companies, you know, so clearly, and the, the Airbnb letter is actually quite beautiful. I, I really recommend people seek it out because uh, it really lays out the case for why um, a company such as it should see value right. bearing ownership with, yeah. with people who are contributing to the company. Yeah, I think they're starting to get it. I think, I think it's just a little bit of a almost like, oh, crap. 
Yeah. Now, now what do we, how do we modernize ourselves? And, and well, I'm not sure. My experience I, is a lot of founders of- founded their companies for reasons like, you know, because they wanted to actually enable cool things in the world and en- enable the sharing of value. But the only pathway they were given was the VC pathway. Well, it's, it's, that's the pathway right through the tragedy of the boardroom, which is what we talk about quite a bit, which is that, yeah. that purely sort of shareholder driven mentality where decisions are made to maximize shareholder value and legally mandated to do that right like they have a fiduciary duty to do that so it's it's you know only these um well and that's where i think it goes off the rails in my opinion is if you're if you're not operating in a co-op or a public good you know public benefit corporation or something that allows the the, the um the board directors to, to make decisions other than just what's going to maximize shareholder value. I think structurally you're, you're sort of got one hand tied behind your back in my opinion. So, um, fortunately there's a, you know, this is, this is a really, you know, in a small way, exploding space, you know, and, and you, you know, you all are part of this, you know, organizations like purpose and, um, you know, the others, you know, it's a, it's a growing area where people are trying to figure out how to, uh, how to make, you know, the, those decisions more accountable to the right people. And, and it's, you know, it's exciting. So how long have you been working in the, the co-op platform space again? You said, uh, what, 10 years, something like that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I was, I got into it out of, you know, my, my youth was shaped by 20, 28, uh, 2008. Right. You know, and I right. was, you know, did a, a book early on then about Occupy Wall Street. You know, I was I was running news uh, uh, a news platform about protest movements, and and then you know I started getting more interested in you know what do we do about this stuff, and right. I saw lots of those protesters getting into cooperatives and and seeing mm. you know seeing okay this is if you were to ask this generation that was you know screwed over by this event. Um, you know, what would you want instead? You know, the demand, the question was always, what is your demand to occupy Wall Street, right? And the demand was essentially, we want a cooperative economy. You know, we want an economy that's accountable to people. And uh, so I just got really fascinated by the, the new generation rediscovering this old cooperative movement. Um, and, and, you know, I also realized all these ways in which, you know, my family was shaped by this cooperative movement, you know, that my grandfather, you know, got electricity, you know, his, the farm he grew up on only got electricity in, you know, in Colorado here, uh, when, you know, the rural electric cooperatives came and, uh, you know, he ended up, uh, uh running a national cooperative for hardware stores, you know, and, and, and it, it's a, uh, a story that we don't tell, you know, that economic democracy is, is part of our history, has shaped our world, and, um, and we don't give it any credit. Uh, mm. and, uh, and, and even though the young people getting involved in it now and, and starting to rediscover it often don't realize um, the power of the thing they're starting to play with. Yeah, I don't um, think they do. I, I mean, I, I think we, we're missing um, a, a context of history too. I think that history is not something that's being promoted um, generally in, 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 you know, most kids' schools, you know, like, I mean, it's well, there, I, but I, they're well, not- te- the, the the person in charge of the, the, the uh, primary school education association uh, uh, association for economics education and you know in high schools he had he didn't even know what a cooperative was um yeah and, and i mean that's what i'm talking that, about is like you, you know, know i mean i i i'll be honest like i'm um i got a couple of years on you and i'm telling you man like i literally as i'm sort of like pontificating on and sort of musing about some of these concepts you know like people would mention things to me. Have you read this book or talked to this person? Or have you, have you seen this paper? And I'm like, no. And you go and look at these things and you're like, wait a minute. Like, and then when you actually trace it back, you know, I mean, some of these things have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years conceptually. And it's the format in which I think we now have the capability to execute them um, with technology really uh, providing that component, that missing piece of protection at least the, the promise of that, right? The possibility of it, we'll see if we can actually execute it. But I think that's what's, that's what's making it the groundswell resurge, I think, is like, well, I think there's a lot of systemic things that are happening, but in conjunction with just advancements in tech, it seems like it's 
ripening very, very quickly. Yeah. What are your What are your predictions on that? When do you think? Uh, what do you think the groundswell is going to yield, and when do you think we're going to find this new model of scalability, scaling value, as I call it? Like we found the old model, right? We know how to scale model value through the VC mechanism and through private equity, and those are two methods that work, right? Like we know that they work. Most of the people that I run around with aren't, aren't decrying capitalism. We're just calling for a new version of it, right? Like we want a community stakeholder driven, you know, sort of aligned, sustainable, sustainably benevolent version of this where it's not exploitive and it's, but we're not trying to be socialists. I mean, that's not a good outcome. I don't think in the pure sense of it, like I'd rather, I'd rather see incentives and, and, people participating and contributing and being creative and doing all sorts of really cool things in alignment with themselves too. getting the 70% who aren't aligned with who they are doing something that is aligned with who they are. Cause I think that just multiplies productivity, which ultimately multiplies value, right? That's the way I see it. Absolutely. And you know, this go, going back to this idea of how do you enable the, um, the, the economy to support the things that people actually want and want to do. You know, that to me is the key question. And, and you know, I've been, I, you know, in, in terms of timing, I think we're in an, a very essential moment for this. You know, when I, when I think about the history of the cooperative movement, um, no period in U.S. history has been more significant than the New Deal. You know, so it was when the, yeah, the depression occurred and people saw very nakedly that investor ownership doesn't care about you, right? Inve you know, the investor owners were not going to bring electricity to to uh, rural America, just like today, r in investor-owned broadband companies aren't bringing broadband to rural America. And, um, and but this, the hurt of that neglect um, became very, very acute in that period. And people um, saw the need for alternative financing mechanisms um, wouldn't even say alternative, like real financing mechanisms. So then you got um, the Farm Credit Act, and and that's the that produced the hundred thirty billion dollar cooperative bank down in in uh, South, South Denver, CoBank, a cooperative that's a bank that is huge and that is designed to invest in in co-ops. It brought us, um, in addition to you know the housing financing policy, the thirty year mortgage, uh, uh, is a result of that period. Uh, result of creating a secondary market to enable people to become owners of their homes. The, the credit union legislation that um, made credit unions uh, uh, publicly backed. Uh, and, and so this enabled people to have community financial institutions where banks were not touching people, not helping people uh, access capital and the Rural Electrification Act, which electrified rural America through cooperatives. Um, and this is, you know, these are all examples of how there was a need for a public response because it, there was such a clear market failure in meeting people's needs. And I think we're, we're entering that again. We have a situation where the so-called essential workers are not being treated as remotely essential by our economy. Uh, we have, um, a, you know, massive unemployment situation. We have, uh, we have, uh, you know, major questions hanging over us of who's going to own what and how are we going to create the next wave of innovation that is going to meet the challenges around, you know, around remote work, around um, around green energy, um, and you know, that, and what we what we we need to recognize is that we're surrounded by people who want to do those things, who want to take on those challenges, but who don't have the capital access to do it. Um, so that's why you know I think we're we're in a moment where we need to look back to the ambition of the of the New Deal programs that we're willing to reshift how capital flows in the economy, and um, you know, and and the blockchain space is in a is in a really unique place. I think there's an opportunity for an alliance between. Uh, blockchain folks who want to create, you know, community funded and supported and owned um, uh, projects, you know, that's what, you know, the, the better parts of the whole ICO craze were about, right? right? And, you know, the cooperative movement, which, which wants to create businesses, you know, grounded in, you know, grounded in economic democracy. So, you know, the, the opportunity to bring these forces together um, to meet this challenge of, of, you know, what I think is going to be a deepening market failure um, is immense. And, and, and it's really a lot of the same solutions. It's just, we need a, a, a fair and accountable framework uh, that supports community ownership and community 
uh, capitalizing community initiatives. Um, and, and I think you could kind of create a, a universal um, uh, framework to support that kind of thing uh, uh, that, would, uh, that, that would cover and, and create a, a, a regulatory framework for blockchain projects and a regulatory framework for- For community, crowdsourcing, investors. community funding, investor right. accreditations, you know, all that, all this stuff that currently gets in the way of of funding sustainably these kinds of projects and, and getting these entrepreneurs the right capital. And yeah, I agree. And uh, look, I, 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 um, it's going to be really interesting, um, to see what comes first, the chicken or the egg. I mean, are we going to somehow stumble on this funding mechanism strategy just because a project tried it and it's going to be successful? Or do you think we're going to come up with this, uh, just independent of any one project? I mean, well, I, I have the, an opinion, the, but the legacy of the, you know, of the New Deal was that experiments that had been happening for a couple decades ended up becoming the model for the for the outcome. So credit unions, uh, rural electric companies, um, uh, you know, all these things were tested out before and were uh, adopted. I see. Interesting. Um, but you know, w the real danger of that is it is those were silos. So right now, you know, I've, I tried to, for instance, organize a conference of co-ops across Colorado. The credit union people and the rural electric people don't have any desire to talk to each other because their policy, their enabling policies are so different and they don't really even feel themselves as part of a common movement. Um, I think this time we need to recognize there are all these needs you know, ranging from, you know, uh, urban communities trying to own their own businesses and blockchain entrepreneurs trying to invent the future, right? And recognize that there's a common thread across them, which is, which is community ownership. And rather than creating a bunch of piecemeal interventions, you know, that bank down the road, you know, it can't invest in the new co-op startups that I work with because it was created with narrow policy. You know, instead, we need to be thinking about um, a broad framework that encourages creativity, encourages innovation, and that covers this breadth of use cases uh, around the missing piece of community ownership that, you know, that we really need here. And so I think if we have that comprehensive, if we add our, 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 the lessons from our early experiments together with a, a, a vision for, for a comprehensive you know, political and, and policy strategy, um, you know, then I think we can, we can do both at once. Yeah. It's, I, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by what I've seen over the past several years. Also, some of it's been a little bit painful, you know, to go through the ICO craze was one phase that was like, no, stay away <laughs> from the light. But, you know, people ran in and they did all sorts of things, but I think the market calibrated because of that. But it seems like, I think it seems like wisdom has been gained a lot faster than I would have expected. And just seeing the shifting sands and narratives in the blockchain space and what people are talking about, like, you know, um, uh, incremental decentralization and, and sort of like, you know, really bootstrapping and, and really tackling, uh, you know, state and federal policy, you know, trying to really get into the, you know, how do we how do we evolve versus you know it's the evolution versus revolution kind of thing and it seems like we've matured a lot on that front um i'm not sure that we've gotten all the loose bricks yet but it seems like they're coming though i mean it, i mean at least that's the hope I, I mean i think i think you're right that there's a there the acceleration the this pace of learning is is faster than for instance what we saw with the development of the early cooperative movement right which took about a century to get um you know oh it's get, fast I, I think i i think it's really yeah. fast i mean even i mean we took about a year doing our research in in cooperative law as you know and we we um i mean gosh it was longer than that 18 months and because all of that groundwork had been laid, I mean, it totally accelerated our learnings, like, because we, we basically got a, you know, we got the answers to the test in some ways, and we was just more educating ourselves and understanding and then, and then, t and then visioning sort of what could be next, right? So it's, uh, it's going to be very interesting. So Nathan, we have a couple of questions coming in from um, 
our viewership here. One from Joshua T. Do you want to take a couple questions? Sure. Uh, Nathan, do you have a favorite design making model? Pure consensus, holacracy, sociocracy, etc. Um, I don't have a favorite, but I've been building a tool to help people uh, find the ones that are right for them. Uh, and that's called Community Rule. Uh, it's at communityrule.info. And it's a it is very much a work in progress, but it's a tool designed to enable groups to design their, uh, uh, you know, what their governance structure should be. And, um, and we've got some templates there that include some of the examples uh, you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it really depends on the context. You know, for instance, I'm, you know, a pretty democratic sort of person, but, um, but I think it makes a lot of sense early on in a lot of early stage projects to have, you know, the kind of benevolent dictator at the start. Um, right. uh, and, and so it really depends on the stage. And one of the things that I think we need to gain, uh, you know, greater um, uh, skill in doing is is moving between systems, being comfortable, knowing when it, it makes sense to shift gears and, and to reorient. Uh, and uh, to have kind of mini revolutions and to also be innovating. You know, you, we were just talking about the accelerating the, the, the uh, learning process. And, and one of the things that's been really fun to see on community rules, people can post their rules to the site and starting mm -hmm. to see people learn from each other's rules and copy things from each other. Um, that to me is going to be when, you know, that, that's yeah. when things open really Open source start government, got open source exactly. governance. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I mean, look, I, I, I think, you know, the human essence is, is very, a very powerful thing. And we've created historically such a competitive scarcity driven, you know, fear driven sort of mechanism for sharing creativity, right? Like, and it seems like we're sort of moving away from that in a lot of respects, which I welcome because it just feels like there's a lot of things that just don't need to be monetized. And in it's like the public utility infrastructure stuff, right? Like in, in, in this case, the creativity around governance and sharing experiences and, and really the learnings is going to just accelerate it even that much more. It seems like, is there, um, well, I guess I guess your answer is it really depends on the use case for that. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Do you have I any mean, Do you have any thoughts on quadratic voting specifically? Yeah, I, I, I think it's it's a really interesting tool that could make sense in certain contexts. You know, it's it's you know for those who aren't uh, familiar with it, it's kind of a model that allows um, that's based on the assumption that people are kind of paying per vote, um, but it measures those pay those votes. Um, in according to a kind of um, diminishing return. So the more you pay, you keep getting more votes, but it's less and less and, and it pays back into the system. It's, it's a, you know, it, it's a little counterintuitive at first, uh, but it really a fascinating proposal. You know, what, what kind of rubs me the wrong way is when it's proposed as, oh, this, this is the optimal, you know, means of governance for everything or for mo for a, a, a large uh, range of, of uh, things. And, and I, th I think rather it's, it's, you know, it's a useful tool for certain things. Um, it's a really valuable contribution. What I want to see is, you know, a hundred more such new governance structures. So rather than us thinking about democracy as this button that we push on or off or a constitution that has to look a certain way, um, like as, you know, the West has been importing, you know, a kind of liberal democracy over to every possible context it can find in its colonial reach. Um, instead, to, to recognize that actually what we need is we need much more open conversations and more people like, you know, Gwen, Gwen Weil, who, you know, was one of the developers of that model, to right. be, you know, to be developing lots and lots of new um, techniques that we can use to better reflect um, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the accountability that we deserve in our systems. So to me, that's just, you know, that's just a wonderful quiver to, ha you know, wonderful arrow to have in our quiver. But, uh, you know, let's not imagine that that's all we're going to need. Yeah, well, there's a lot to do. There's a ton to do. So I'm going to give a quick shout out to Kevin Iwaki, who said, hi, everyone. That was his question. So I'm going to go ahead and close Great question, out. Hey, Kevin. Good to see hey, you. Yeah, good to see you, Kevin. Um, 
Kevin is a very able practitioner of, of quadratic voting. So I, I, uh, um, I'm embarrassed that my, my rambling answer was, uh, was heard by his ears. Uh, he's involved with Gitcoin and in uh, putting quadratic voting to use in, in funding open source projects. It's a really uh, excellent use case of how to, uh, you know, how to create kind of um, self-reinforcing patterns and in supporting uh, common good projects. So um, he's yep, really I, I like how he has sort of merged the idea of voting with capital. So it's like, it's really actually merging the concept of quadratic voting with and really just making a subset of it with funding because it's really actually putting in the economics into the vote, which I yeah. think is, is a really powerful concept. Um, we've actually, uh, we've been involved in the funding and the, the um, grant rounds and we've also, I've done some contributions in it. I've experimented with it. It's been kind of great. Question is, um, should we QF all the things? Yes, I think we should, Kevin. At least that's one one avenue that we're going to explore. So quadratic funding, I think, is is something that um, I'm a big fan of. So we're going to, I'm, at least I'm going to continue to support it. What about you, Nathan? Well, again, yes, I'm going to continue to support it. But but one thing I really appreciate about Opolis when, um, you know, we, when we had a call about your uh, your uh, paper er early on was, um, was, you know, I asked, okay, how are these groups going to govern themselves? And you said, I kind of don't want to answer that question. I want that to be, you know, that to be something the groups discover. Um, and, you know, I, at first I was kind of like, no, no, let's impose, you know, like um, Jacobin democracy on, on all of these things. What a great opportunity to, you know, impose worker democracy. But, um, you know, I, more and more, I think you're right that we need to be creating spaces mm -hmm. where there's where spaces there's and tool sets for diverse. Yes. Um, you know, diverse approaches and, and uh, you know, and that's going to, that's going to produce both the innovation and the, and the kind of healthy uh, uh, responses. Yeah. Well, with that, um, we're going to wrap it up for this episode of Opolis Public Radio. Nathan, it's been a pleasure. I mean, you're, you're, um, the work that you do, I find not only fascinating, but so critical in, in the context in which you're doing it in our educational system. I couldn't think of a more important um, curriculum and, and just effort to be doing. So, you know, thank you for all that you do and that you contribute in your own creativity that you're putting out into the world. So I would say that you're probably not one of the 70%. You're probably in the 30% who actually enjoys and is aligned with what they're, I what love they're my doing. Job. I feel yeah. very grateful to have the chance to, you know, serve the state of Colorado and, and, and its students and, and, uh, and the, and the broader community. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Thanks for, Thanks for having me on. Thanks for all you're doing. Well, we're going to keep doing it and there's going to be much more Colorado stuff coming. So we'll keep you up to date. So thanks everyone for listening. Remember to subscribe to Opolis's YouTube channel for more videos just like this or to your uh, podcast distribution mechanism of choice if you prefer the audio version. If you're a freelancer, gig worker, independent contractor, entrepreneur, solopreneur, whatever, and you're looking for an employment solution to become self-sovereign, make sure to visit the Opolis website. That's opolis.co, O-P-O-L-I-S dot C-O. And we'll see you there. Thanks, everybody. That's it.